Trans, the war wolf. According to Anglo-Irish ghost hunter Elliot O'Donnell, the many ways of becoming a werewolf include A. By eating a wolf's brains. B. By drinking water out of a wolf's footprint. Or C. By drinking out of a stream from which three or more wolves have been seen to drink. To this end, he cites the following story told by a Dr. Bonner. Ten years ago, Bonner said, I was on a geological expedition in Montenegro. My usual guide, Nero, had been disabled by an accident, so I chose a man called Kranz. Nero warned me against him. Kranz has the evil eye, he said. He will bring misfortune on you. Choose, choose someone else. Now Kranz was tall and lean, pockmarked, with sandy hair and eyes that had a peculiar cast. But he was civil in manner and moderate in his terms. Nero almost wept as he watched us go. I shall never see you again, he said. Never. We spent the first night in a wayside inn, and as our road was blocked by a landslide, Kranz suggested we take another road, which, though wild and rough, was shorter. I agreed. I had no reason to suspect Kranz of any sinister motive. But, but, I could not help but notice a change in his character. He was restless, muttered to himself, and kept talking talking about the supernatural. The country was certainly forbidding. All day we journeyed down a narrow and precipitous trail. At the bottom we halted three or four hours to wait for the moon. A northeast wind, cold and biting, came whistling over the hill and was sucked down into the hollow where we sat on the chilly stones. The moment we sighted the slightly depressed orb of the moon, an extraordinary scene burst upon us. There, glittering in the moonlight, was a huge pile of white rocks looking like the fortifications of some vast, fabulous city. There were towers and pyramids, crescents and domes and dizzy pinnacles, all in the unearthly light of the moon. It was through a cleft in these rocks that Kranz said we must go. It is called the Haunted Valley, and said to be under the spell of the Grey Spirits. The Grey Spirits, a species of phantasm, half man and half animal, which could turn humans into wild beasts. Horses, he said, showed the greatest reluctance to enter the valley. Sure proof the place was haunted. I must say, it looked haunted. The path by which we descended was almost perpendicular and filled with shadows. On reaching the bottom, we found ourselves opposite the pile of white rocks, at the base of which roared a stream. Kranz now said our best plan was to halt for the night. But I said that I preferred to push on. Kranz then said he was too exhausted to proceed, too exhausted to proceed, and whined to such an extent that I finally gave in, and lying down under the cover of a boulder, I did fall asleep. Waking up... Waking up, Kranz was nowhere to be seen. His odd behavior had at last made me frightened. Was the valley really haunted? The moonlight rendered every object I looked upon so vivid. 
and and the water in the moonlight the water presented every variety of green and blue but made no sound it was completely silent summoning my courage i dipped my fingers in the stream it was quite cold and limpid i was still puzzling over this phenomena when i heard a cry a, a weird ominous cry human and yet animal for a few seconds i was too frightened to move but at last i stepped cautiously in the direction of the noise treading as lightly as i could and then i froze kneeling beside the stream with its back turned to me was an extraordinary figure a thing with a man's body and an animal's head a dark shaggy head with pointed ears as i stared it bent down lapped the water and raising its head uttered the same harrowing sound the same harrowing sound i had heard before i then saw that its hands were becoming long furry paws armed with sharp claw-like talons i screamed and the creature swung around and with a snarl of rage rushed savagely at me i shrieked again as the thing sprang its jaws wide its eyes red with rage i struck at it wildly as it closed on me and and gripping me tightly round the body with its sinewy arms it hurled me to the ground my head hit a stone and i passed out when i awoke i was surprised to find nero sitting on a rock watching me while beside him was cranz's blood-stained body nero explained convinced cranz would harm you i determined to set out in pursuit by a miracle the effect of my accident suddenly wore off and i felt absolutely well i borrowed a horse and reaching the inn where you passed the night i learned the route you had taken and i pressed on the ground being moist in places i had no difficulty in following hearing the howl of some wild animal i arrived just in time to find a werewolf about to devour you a bullet from my rifle killed it and a close inspection proved it was none other than our friend with the evil eye krantz 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 a, a werewolf yes krantz he took you here because he had made up his mind to drink the water of the enchanted stream and so become a werewolf his object in doing so was to destroy a young farmer who had stolen away his sweetheart however he is dead now but a warning to you to trust no one who has the evil eye o'donnell concludes belief in the evil eye is universal i have followed the careers of several people who had this this terrible ability and their histories a being of sin or sorrow often both but the werewolf doesn't always have the evil eye sometimes it has long straight eyebrows which meet in a line over the nose sometimes the third finger of each hand is the longest finger with fingernails which can be which can be red almond shaped and curved sometimes they have ears set rather low and far back on their heads and sometimes they have the long swinging stride the long swinging gait of an animal most of these features are present in hereditary werewolves 
and are frequently developed by those people who become werewolves, who choose to become werewolves. So, dear listeners, why not take a good look in the mirror, in in the bathroom mirror? Do any of these characteristics describe you? I think I'll take a look. Just a minute, just a moment. Oh. Oh, no. 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 No, it can't. No. How? If this is your first visit to my channel, please consider subscribing. My name is Warren, and I write and tell original ghost stories and original horror stories featuring such cryptids as the Night Floaters, Werewolves, and the Black-Eyed Children. So again, please consider subscribing. Please help me to reach my goal of 2,500 subs. Till midnight... Cheers. Text for today's story, courtesy of Project Gutenberg, while the pictures used in this video are courtesy of Pix Here, that's PX Here, while the music was the classic Ghost Processional by that patron of the internet, Kevin McLeod. Thank you for listening. Lorna. Lorna had acne and long, unruly hair and liked wearing long, hippie dresses even during the long, hot days of summer. She had a part-time job at the public library and, in lieu of a social life, worked every Friday night. One particularly quiet Friday, a tall, dark young man came up to the desk and said, Do you have any books on werewolves? Do we have any books on werewolves? Lorna said, it being standard library procedure to repeat any and all questions from patrons. The young man just stared at her, and Lorna became aware that he was quite good-looking, with fine aquiline features. Let's, uh, let's have a look in the card catalog, she said finally, stepping from behind the desk. As she walked over to the card drawers, drawers, she could feel him behind her, his eyes drinking in her body. We, we do have a book on werewolves, she told him, unable to totally conceal her surprise that the library owns such a thing. It's, it's called The Book of Werewolves by Sabrina Baring Gould, Lorna said, having unconsciously lowered her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. To herself, Lorna said, Sabrina Baring Gould, I wonder who she was. Show it to me the young man said, and Lorna noticed he had an unusually husky voice. They walked over to the stacks in silence. Lorna was sure he was undressing her with his dark eyes as he followed her into a quiet corner of the building. In the 398s, the folklore section, Lorna pulled a dark green perma-bound volume off the shelf 
Turning to the young man, Lorna whispered, The Book of Werewolves by the, by the Reverend, the Reverend Sabina Baring Gould. You know, it, it says here on the back, he also wrote, Onward, Christian Soldiers. What? The young man whispered back, his knitted brows forming a single dark line above his hard, staring eyes. It's, it's a hymn, Lorna stammered in amazement. Everyone knew onward Christian soldiers, didn't they? Didn't they? I don't know any hymns, the young man said, grabbing the book and turning away. She heard him mumble something, which she thought was thanks, but he didn't turn around. For the rest of her shift, Lorna avoided looking at the young man, and at ten minutes to nine, she phoned her father to remind him to pick her up. From the Book of Werewolves by the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould In France, in Victorian times, an English clergyman decided to explore some prehistoric standing stones erected by the ancient druids. The circular cromlech was on a lonely hilltop, and the divine was unable to find it until just before sundown. A tiny village lay at the base of the hill. Not wanting to walk back to the inn in the dark, the clergyman went to the one meager wine shop in search of a carriage, or at least a horse, to convey him the miles back to his destination. But no carriage and no horse was to be had. The village priest offered his fellow clergy the hospitality of his tiny abode, but the minister was determined to return to his inn. My family is waiting for me there, he said. They will be worried if I don't come back. The bear turned to the peasants, who sat at the rude tables, listening to the conversation. Someone will have to go with Monsieur and guide him back. A statement which led to a general uproar, with all the men talking and gesticulating wildly. The clergyman, who was having some difficulty following the local dialect, realized they seemed to be repeating one particular phrase. Lugaru! 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 What is the loop garu? the clergyman said. A wolf? Oh! Oh, Monsieur le Englishman! said one particularly excited peasant. The loop garu! The loop garu is a fiend! But, but worse than a fiend! A, a man fiend! Or, or even worse! A wolfman fiend! A, a werewolf! Picou! Picou saw it last week, skulking behind a hedge, said another. It, it was as big as a calf, its tongue hanging out, and its eyes blazing like marsh flames. What could two men, four or, or, or five men, do against something like that? As big as a calf, he concluded crossing himself. I see I have no choice but to return alone, the divine said disapprovingly through pursed lips. In any event, the walk may do me good. But monsieur, monsieur, the loup-garou, sputtered the excited peasant. The loup-garou doesn't concern Englishmen, the minister answered curtly as he gathered up his hat and walking stick. Turning to the mayor, he added, If I should happen to meet with the loop garou, I shall crop his ears and tail and present them to Monsieur le maire with my compliments. And then he stepped out into the night. And... And, and, and the next morning, 
a broken walking stick was found on the ground in front of the mayor's door and nailed to the door a pair of severed human ears. In the Victorian era, an English clergyman on vacation in France, or is it France, went to view some prehistoric standing stones which had been erected by the ancient Druids. Unfortunately, he didn't reach the site until late in the afternoon, and so it was dusk by the time he went to leave. Night was falling, and the darkness was beginning to take control. So he went to an inn in the nearby village to inquire about hiring a carriage to take him back to his hotel, which was several miles away. But alas, no carriage, no conveyance of any kind could be had, not even a dog cart. The minister was not even able to hire a horse to ride back to his lodgings. Now, the village priest happened to be present in the inn, and he invited the clergyman to spend the night with him, but the clergyman wanted to get back to his hotel. <coughs> he said, my family is no doubt worried about me. I need to get back tonight. And so the priest turned to the peasants who were seated around in the inn at the rude wooden tables, their wine in front of them, and said, someone is going to have to walk Monsieur back to his hotel. Well, this simple statement created a complete pandemonium, complete uproar, or to use that good old fashioned term, a complete hubbub. And the clergyman watched, watched astonished as the men were, they were gesticulating and they kept repeating over and over and over again, one word, loop garou, loop garou, loop garou, loop garou. What is this loop garou, the clergyman asked. Is that like a wolf? To which he received the following reply, and I quote from the text. He received the following answer. Oh, Monsieur le Englishman, said one particularly excited peasant. The loup garou is a fiend, but worse than a fiend, a man fiend, or even worse, a wolf man fiend, a werewolf. Piku, Piku saw it last week, skulking behind a hedge, said another. It was as big as a calf, its tongue hanging out, and its eyes blazing like marsh flames. Marsh flames. What could two men, four or five men, do against something like that? As big as a calf, he concluded, crossing himself. I see. I have no choice but to walk back alone. I see I have no choice but to walk back alone. In the dark, the clergyman said coldly. But, but monsieur, the loup garou sputtered a peasant. My good man, the minister said with disdain, the loup garou does not concern Englishmen. And with that, he gathered up his walking stick and his hat, and he headed for the door. But before leaving the room, he turned and said, And if I encounter your loop guru, I shall crop his ears and cut off his tail. The next morning, a broken walking stick, which looked like the minister's walking stick, and a crumpled hat that looked like the minister's hat, was found on the road in front of the inn and nailed to the inn door were two severed human ears. That's the first chapter of the Book of Werewolves written by the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould. Now Sabine Baring Gould was one of those interesting and eclectic Englishmen uh, that lived back during the Victorian era. He wrote novels, he collected folk songs, uh, he wrote books on travel, history, and mythology, and in 1865, he wrote the Book of Werewolves, which delves quite a lot, quite, in quite the de which delves 
in detail into the mythological foundations of lycanthropy and includes several chapters on the trial and execution of the original Bluebeard, Marshal Gilles de Ra, or Marshal Gilles de Ré. Gilles de Ré. I'm never quite sure how you pronounce that name. Now, if you've never heard of the Reverend Baring, Sabine Baring Gould, don't feel bad because you probably heard a song that he wrote, maybe even sang it yourself. It goes like this. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Okay, okay, I'll stop right there, I, I promise. That probably set music back 20 years. But I wonder if I can now claim that this is actually uh, a music video. I've left links in the description to the text of the Book of Werewolves, as well as the audiobook, so you can see how I changed that initial story. And as well, I've left uh, links to a nice recording of uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, complete with uh, the lyrics. Now, as a Canadian, I was familiar with the term loup garou because that is the term for werewolf in the French-speaking parts of Canada, such as the province of Quebec. And out here in Western Canada, which is the home of the Métis, who are part First Nations, part Francophone, these werewolves are called Rougarous. Rougarous. Rougar it's fun to say. Rougarou. After me, everyone. Rougarou. So, dear listeners, thanks for watching tonight. Stay safe. Stay subscribed. Hit the bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. If this is your first time visiting my channel, my name is Warren. And I write and tell original ghost stories and original horror stories. So please consider subscribing. And, of course, stay hungry. I'm now going to ask the lovely and talented camera crew to give us a panorama shot of a very ominous storm which seems to be approaching. So if this video seems a little rushed, it's because uh, we wanted to get it in before the rain and the hail starts to fly. And who knows, around here, maybe even a tornado. So... Till midnight, cheers.